I mean, so far, I know we're only seven seconds in. I'm having the race of my life. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> that, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Jesus. Got a doorbell, you know? <laughs> Which means the doorbell. <laughs> Welcome back to TDP, the Distance Project. It's me, your favourite one-legged <laughs> friend. And we're here for a, a very special episode. We've got a lot to catch up on. Uh, in this video, we're going to take you through what's going on down here, when I'm going to be back running, some of your questions, and all the other good stuff from this week on. Down but not out. Cue big intro. <laughs> can see, I've not yet packed. Uh, well, what happened, packed. but yeah. Um, right. How's, how's crutches life? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. What date are we on? We are on the 11th and a race on the 1st, so I'm 10 days deep right now. Um, yeah, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, this is a bit of a recovery series we're going to do, basically, where I don't know if I'm ever going to be good at running again. That's a serious question, but we're going to document whether it can happen or not. So essentially, we're going to bring out a weekly video. That's what we're aspiring to do. So serious frequency here. Uh, what I'm getting up to, how things are progressing, things with surgery, as I get back into training, things I'm doing, diet, psychology, your questions, anything you're interested in, basically. This is basically my attempt of flipping a negative, pretty shit situation, to be honest, excuse my language, into, okay, how can we get some value out of it? Keep me motivated because I'm doing something every week. Me and Charlie still, you know, working together and hopefully bring you some value outside of going to races and things like that. Uh, but we will have race footage of other people, all those big productions that you are used to seeing. They'll be uh, on the channel as well, just not featuring me, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, we'll get a coffee, sit down and uh, talk about what happened. <laughs> In uh, honour of the recent world champion, Jordy Beamish, we're going to do a bean shout out text there. Pace Coffee, the one and only. This is a 1kg, also known as the fat boy, unofficially. Uh, much like myself these days. Um, yeah, premium Ethiopian blend. That's all. <laughs> Outtakes. <laughs> Right, keep that off the camera for now. Um, so for those people that don't know why, uh, why you're in a boot, yeah. could you uh, bring us up to speed on what's, uh, what's going on? Yeah, if you're new here and you're probably thinking, what is this guy doing on the channel? I'm actually a runner. Look, it's official. That's me. Wore this for a good 550 metres before I uh, tore my Achilles. <laughs> but um, yeah, essentially, I was racing at the World Indoor Championships, which I'd worked hard to qualify for by running a 3.53 mile. You can watch the video by clicking one of these little cards up here. Um, and went to the World Indoor Championships, was in my heats, which is basically like a semi-final, and unfortunately had a bit of an incident where I resulted in a pretty major in, uh, injury, which I've not actually watched back the video yet, which we're going to do later in the video to uh, see what the commentators had to say, what happened, talk you through how I was feeling at the time and everything that's happened in the 10 days since I got injured. Um, as you can see, I'm in pretty decent spirits. I think positivity, optimism can get a long way, uh, but there is definitely gonna be some shit moments, some times where I'm down, some times where I'm frustrated. I've already had quite a few of them in the last few days. Um, so yeah, it's not all gonna be a bit of a, a joke and a parody video. Hopefully you can get some, some serious value from this. Um, yeah, on with the brewing. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> there she goes. There she goes. There she's, she goes. She's roaring the old girl. <laughs> Come on, the Breville. <laughs> Get that. Shout out to our little partners at Coros. Look at that for a combo. Just a girl. Do you want milk? Uh, or do you want it black? I'll, I'll take a black coffee, please. Okay. Large. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if this is like a, a normal thing or not, but I often watch back my races, especially if I've done well, or if even if I've not done that well, but I'm interested in what's happened. For whatever reason, I've not been able to bring myself to watch the race. I think just because either one, I don't want to see what happened, or two, it's going to wind me up. Commentators or whoever like saying like, oh, it's just cramp or it's just whatever, which other people have told me when a bloody, you know, sliced my Achilles tendon in half. Um, but... For the sake of the video, and also because I need to just get it done at some point, because um, it keeps getting suggested to me on YouTube, we're going to watch back the race, and I'm going to walk you through 
um, how it happened from my brain and what I foresee happening compared to what you can see on the screen. Um, take it away. So this is the guy that fucks me. How's <laughs> <laughs> the warm up and everything, pre me all that stuff good? Yeah, uh, everyone says this when it doesn't go well, but I actually felt great. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone says that though, so you never actually know. We'd not done the hard bit of the race, so you never know how you're going to feel. But as we'll see, I think I was in a pretty good position, etc. Et and also, it's worth noting from my heat, um, two medalists from the final, Beamish and um, Kessler. So, pretty stacked heat I was in. Yeah, you mentioned before you had a pretty hard heat, you thought. Yeah, I thought my heat was hard, but I definitely thought I could qualify. Um, there I am. This looks, this looks good. Nice little wave. A few flags. It's all going so well, isn't it? <laughs> what was weird as well is, I don't know, if you've watched the um, Boston video, you'll see I was really nervous before, like weirdly nervous and pressure and stuff like that. And I think being that nervous and then still performing made me go like, it doesn't really matter how you feel, like you can still get the job done. I, it was, I felt eerily not nervous for this. It was so like, I was like pumped up, ready to go, switched on. Like I don't know if it's just because it was like, well, I've come this far, there's kind of no pressure on me or what, but I really wasn't nervous. It was, you know, actually really enjoyable build up to the race, where sometimes I'm thinking like, oh, why do I do this, you know? Does a lot of work in that regard, and just uh, burst off the line to try and ease himself away from any trouble. I mean, so far, I know we're only seven seconds in, I'm having the race of my life. <laughs> I'm riding in second place in the World Indoor Championships. I think he knew that football, he was never going to be one of the top footballers. So what did he see? Can you hear this on the camera? Or not? Potentially. What, what did they say at the start about? He just said does a lot of work on social media, which he got to do by bad. Then he said uh, he knew he was never going to make it as a footballer. <laughs> so, yeah. This is good though. All jokes aside, I'm not actually taking a piss because it's great that people like this uh, not people like this, that like commentary, commentators and stuff that do the research and like are given the notes or do the notes themselves to actually build up pictures of athletes because that's the stuff you want to hear, like what they get up to, what they're interested in, where their careers come from. So I yeah. like that. This one has slowed down, so it all comes together. What was your plan in, in hindsight? Um, not in hindsight, uh, before the race, what was your, what were you thinking going into this? My, pl you, my plan was to basically not be outside the top four at any point. It was basically me and um, my coach Nick had talked before and we were like, you know, if it's fast, great, because you're in good form and, like, you've just run the equivalent of 3.36. So, like, if it goes really fast, fine, just race the race. If it's slow, just keep yourself up there, stay, you know, in and around the mix and then you know that you can close well and just be tactically smart. Because um, similar to the road mile I did in Riga and things like that, your PB and how strong you are in a time trial doesn't necessarily relate when you're doing, like, a road mile or an indoor race where it's far more about positioning, tactics, all that kind of stuff. Um, as you saw at the UK Indoor Championships, Adam and myself had faster times than Piers. Piers beat us. You know, it's one of those things. Right, I'm going to skip a little bit. Okay, is this where it happens? Oh, shit, I've gone. Yeah. I've skipped. I'm, off, I'm out of the race. <laughs> shit! <laughs> oh, no! Oh! Let's watch that back. It's, that's so weird. In my head, I did it literally near the bend. Do you see what I mean? But look how far I must have gone. Yeah, well, right, right the way around. Ooh! <laughs> that, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Jesus. Let's go around again. I'm going to explain what's happened here. I'm going to explain. So basically, right, I'll stop it here. So, based on what I just said to you about my tactics, I didn't want, really want to be outside the top four, with the idea being that as it wound up, I needed to be in a position to follow the moves. As you can see here, we're going slow, so we're all really within our abilities, and I'm what, one, two, three, four, I've now slipped into fifth as Kessler's come round me, and I'm on the rail, and because I'm on the rail, in my head I'm thinking, if a couple of the guys come round me, I'm really going to be trapped. So all I've tried to do here, Oh, here is I'm right on the rail. I'm just I'm moving out a tiny touch, so I'm in the middle of lane one, not on the very inside of lane one. Completely normal, just gives you a little bit more room to move. And as I've done that, you can literally see here. As my that is crazy, that you can actually see that. As my left leg, which is now looking like this, Charlie. As my left leg has come down, the guy behind me, obviously completely the accident and stuff like that, I'm only joking that he's done something wrong. His foot, as my foot's coming back, his foot's coming down, and his spikes have come down on the bottom of my leg. Now, getting spiked is completely normal. I get spiked in every race. Like, I get it all over the top of my legs. It's just one of those things. However, unfortunately, his spike 
has caught me in a certain way that it's, uh, spoiler alert, essentially sliced through a bit of my tendon. So what's happened is, as I've been spiked, I've then continued to take extra steps. And as I've taken the first, so here I get spiked, as I've taken the first couple of steps, I've grabbed my calf because it feels like I've got cramp in my calf, like it almost like it's seized up. And I thought to myself, okay, maybe I've landed in a weird way. If I take a few extra steps, I'll get rid of it. And also in my head, I was like, if you complete the race, you could always protest because that's, you know, like it might be, I don't know what's gone on behind me as to where, how he's how he's hit into the back of me or whatever. But here you can see, I take a few extra steps and I'm like, okay, no, that's really not good, really not good. And essentially what's happened is um, where the spikes have come into me, I don't know if Charlie, we can put like an image of what it looked like after I'd got it stitched up, but essentially his full foot has come down on me. So he's had, you've got six spikes on the bottom of your shoe. They've come down on me and one of them has sliced partially into my Achilles tendon. So if you imagine your Achilles tendon as like a really tight elastic band, as soon as that's got some fragility in it, i.e. like a bit of it is, you know, missing or torn, if you then take another step on it in spikes in a world championship at full pelt, the chances of that elastic band going like that is pretty high. And that's basically exactly what's happened. Hence why I've then felt the pull in my calf and like, okay, I can't really run anymore. That's easy for me to say now because I've had 10 days and I've been told by doctors and stuff what's actually happened. In the moment, you, you're just like, what the fuck's happened to me, basically? So here, so you can see I cannot even put my foot on the ground. And that's why I felt like it happened on the corner. So I've actually traveled probably another like 40 meters or 30 meters down the straight before I've then sat down. And then I'm guessing nothing happens, but the race plays on and, and, and that's Have that. Have you seen the bit where the, they get like a nice zoom image of you getting wheeled off? Oh. <laughs> it's... Oh, there I am. So here, again, you can't see, it looks like I'm holding my calf. You can't see any blood or anything. And again, do we have the shoe to hand? Oh, again, we'll put another image on the screen of what my shoe looked like when it's covered in blood. But yeah, it was pff, curtains, basically. Jade! Oh, bless you. You know, oh, it sounds bad, but at least there's like evidence of me doing it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can see a bit of the blood actually. Good eyes, Paula. <laughs> also, um, you still filming, yeah? Shout out to this guy. I think he was called Andrew, but I can't actually remember. He was the. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna butcher this, but the local organising committee, so like World Athletics and whoever is like on site. Obviously, they have all their medical staff and stuff, as well as all the individual teams having their medical staff. And this guy wheeled me all the way off the track behind the like bit of where the stands are back to the team area and then unbeknownst to me I didn't realise it was the same guy this is the guy who actually then stitched me up and stuff like that and he is a doctor he's actually the, the club doctor for um, Hearts football team in Scotland um, and he dropped me a message to say like you know um, I was the one that did it blah blah so big shout out to him because the um, the the medical support and stuff like that was absolutely world class given the circumstances and that obviously how annoyed and stuff I was it was um, it was quality they were very re reassuring so yeah that's um that's that one done. Not the end of the world. Thanks to everybody that messaged me. If you watched it live, at least you got to see about a minute and 20 or a minute and 30. Um, it wasn't, you know, the dream scenario that every athlete wants to happen, but it is what it is. Yeah. Right, we're not going to do this every video, but as this is the uh, first one in the series as such, we'll give you a bit of an update as to um, just the timeline to now, so you've got a full picture of what happened. So as you can see, done the injury. They took me straight back behind the track. Uh, the wound was really deep, bleeding a lot, so I had to get stitches there and then. Um, so yeah, just a bit of local anaesthetic or something like that, some numbing cream. Stitch me up, sorted, boot on, uh, straight home. Uh, well, back to the hotel. Next morning, so about half eight in the morning, so literally 12 hours after the injury, went to the hospital for an MRI scan, um, got the scans and stuff done. And then for the rest of that day, so that's the Saturday and the Sunday, I was just like kind of chilling in my hotel room, uh, going to the stadium uh, to watch the other races because obviously we had a lot of the Brits competing and stuff like that um, and awaiting to get the news on my MRI back and then on the Sunday I got my results from the MRI and they basically said yeah look it's not looking great um, Dr James Brown who's the, the, the head doctor at the at UK Athletics was looked at all the scans and he just said yeah from what we can see it looks like you've got a partial tear in your Achilles tendon which is going to be a considerable injury 
there's two systems. You can either have a conservative approach where essentially they put up your heel with some blocks, try and get the tendon pieces to touch, and then it will naturally heal itself. If anyone's medical here, this is just layman's terms. I don't really know what I'm talking about. Or the other way is surgery, where essentially cut your leg open, fuse it back together manually, and then you hopefully heal. Um, if you're an elite athlete, often surgery is the way to go in order to regain kind of hopefully back to maximum strength. And or if it's a complex situation where like the, the, the ruptures happen in a certain way that it probably won't heal in a conservative approach, you do have to have surgery. So in my case, because of the latter and because I'm also an athlete, I was advised the surgical approach. Um, so between UK Athletics, England Athletics and a program called TAS, which I think stands for the Talented Athlete Support Scheme or something like that. It's basically like a government funded um, scheme for athletes, which I happen to be on. Thank God. Um, they liaise for me to go to a specialist. So I'm working with a, a guy called Professor Mafuli, who is like a, a world renowned guy. If you Google King of Tendons, this, this guy pops up. Shout out to Mafuli. Um, and that's who I'll be having surgery with on Saturday. So today is Monday. I've got surgery coming up this week um, where basically they'll cut me open and uh, see what the crack is and try and mend me. Um, and as a bit of a timeline after that, this is all very general, nothing set in stone. It's just loose things depending on how things go. I'll have approximately three weeks in a cast. So if you've ever like broken your arm or something where you get like a plastic cast, I'll have three weeks of that. Then I'll transition back into a boot like I've got now, which will be for a minimum of eight weeks. So that'll be about 11 weeks we're on. Um, I'll be having regular checkups every kind of three or four to see how things are getting on. After that, depending on the situation, I'll transition to partial weight bearing. So I don't know whether I switch into kind of one of those other moon boot type things or if I just like start wearing a shoe and only partial weight bear. Got no idea how it works. Um, but that will be kind of the next sort of two or three months after that, doing some rehab, trying to regain some strength. And then they approximate around six months is when I'll be back into running training. So that would take us basically to September. Is that right? Yeah, that would take us to about September as to when I'll be doing running training. And then they think I should be able to compete unrestricted, no problems, as if everything was all sunshine and rainbows, definitely for the next indoor season. Um, again, that's such a generic, like, long timeline of things. There's a million things that could happen that could either slow that down or speed that up. Um, but that's basically what we're working towards now. Um, but yeah, in terms of how all of this has been funded and put into place, I have to shout out UK Athletics for all the support when I was actually there because I was away on the trip. Even though I'm not a funded athlete, you know, they sorted out all the MRI, the consultations, all the physios and doctors. I literally couldn't have been in better hands. And I know people sag off UK Athletics a lot for like, why is there more staff than there is athletes and stuff like that. But in my specific situation, I needed everybody's help there and I can't, couldn't be more grateful for that. Uh, and then also shout out to, to England Athletics and this talent support uh, scheme that I'm on um, because that's what's allowed me access to the private medical to be able to go and see a consultant and get surgery that I'm not going to have to pay for myself, which a lot of athletes are in a position where they have to launch a GoFundMe or some sort of fundraising or pay out of their own savings in order to have surgery, which is, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, so I'm really grateful for that, to be fair. Um, obviously, I've worked hard to get to the point. I'm, you know, it's, it's not just luck, but... Um, yeah, it would have cost me a lot of money if I'd if I'd not had that. So for the people that were asking, how do you do it? How do you get scanned so quick? All of that. Um, I'm in a fortunate enough position that that's been, been able to happen so far. So as part of this series, I don't want it just to be me giving you updates or complaining or showing you what I'm up to. I want it to try and be like a real value add where you can learn something. And as part of that, you can send in your questions and we're going to finish every episode with a little mini Q&A kind of five minute segment where I'll answer some of your really quick questions, some things in a bit more detail, just basically whatever's going on. Um, so if you don't already, follow me on Instagram because once a week I'm going to put up uh, one of those story question things where you just type in your questions. I screenshot the ones I like and then I'll answer them as we go. Um, this week, as you can imagine, most of the questions were dominated around what have I been doing since I got injured? Can I do exercise? What have I been doing? Um, the answer is I'm basically doing whatever I can do. So uh, I've got some like free weights in the house, which are just light, kind of like 5, 10 kg stuff. I've been doing core circuits and upper body with those, which has been you know great just to get some exercise done. Um, I've been going to the gym kind of every other day last week, which was basically either to do the ski erg machine, where, you know, you just don't know if you've seen ski erg, probably put a video of that. Um, and then the rowing machine, which I couldn't use my legs with, so I just had to use my arms. So again, that was just some cardio that I could do. Um, since going to see the surgeon on Friday, I got the okay to now start going on the bike. So pretty much every day I'll be going on the bike. I'll probably end up buying one um, to have in the house just so it's easier with the travel time on crutches. 
um, and that's just going to be me basically for the next six months of gradually building up volume on the bike, different intensity, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, pretty boring to an extent, but at the same time, I like the challenge of the fact that actually I'm going to be pretty shit at cycling. Um, it's probably going to feel like 30 minutes is really hard or that intervals are really hard or I don't have much power output. So setting myself the little challenge of trying to get a bit better or stay on the bike for a bit longer and stuff like that. I think I'll be able to gamify in a way that keeps me quite engaged with my personality. Um, so yeah, that answers that question. And now we're going to get into some of the quick fire ones that people sent in on Instagram. Muddle Max 9 says, who will win the Olympic men's 1500 final? Max, it's either going to be this guy or this guy. Uh, Jackson Rahn says, thoughts on the Hoka Max series? Well, Jackson, here's what I prepared earlier. This is the brand new Hoka Max 6. Uh, none of this is sponsored. I don't have to do this, by the way. Um, I'm not 100% sure what I would use this for. As you can see, I have been using it a bit. I think it's pretty good for easy running if you've either got strides at the end and you want something a bit faster, or if you've got some moderate running, like some steady state running, something like that. But my favorite shoe is this. This is the Mac X. This is probably, if I could only have one Hoka shoe, it would probably be this one. Um, this has, I don't think a carbon plate, but like a P-Bax plate, or it's some sort of plate in it, basically. Uh, it's kind of in between your jogging shoe and your like carbon race day shoe. You can use it for tempos, thresholds, track work. It's quite low profile. Um, yeah, this is a really good shoe. And a lot of the top poker athletes all agree that this is kind of um, one that we all like. Uh, Sam Runs London says, what's your top tip for translating road speed to cross-country results? I'd say the fundamental thing for cross-country and why it's different to other types of racing is if you do a 5k on the road and you want to break 20 minutes, you just want to go 4 minute, 4 minute, 4 minute for all your kilometres, just learn how to run one pace. If you do cross-country, you've got hills, twists, turns, mud, things that are going to basically mean you're running slow, then fast, slow, then fast. So getting used to those pace changes is really fundamental. So I would do things like fartleks and interval sessions where you're working at different pace intensities, ideally without much easy jogging rest, make things afloat or things like that. That's my advice. Galeo Sabai, 14, I've said that wrong, says uh, he wants to know how to structure some 510 or half marathon training uh, for six or seven days a week at around 100k. I would follow something like this as my structure. And the final question to wrap up this video is from DLBC42195. In future, please just put your name if you've got like a weird username. Uh, he's 29, he's been running for four years, his PB is 1936 of 5k. Could it be possible to run sub 16 in X amount of years? The question is, uh, or the answer rather is, I've got absolutely no idea because it depends on so many different variables. But what I would say is no matter what your age is, unless you're kind of you know really old, don't judge your age as how much capacity you've got left. View your running age. So if you're 30, but you've only been running for three years, then treat yourself as like a three-year-old runner. And you can do that also if you're 24 and you started when you were 21. Obviously, the certain genetic things and like your recovery time gets a little bit longer as you get older and stuff like that. But generally speaking, think about how long have I been running? How much more volume could I do? How much more intensity could I do? How many other different training stimulus could I try out to make me a better runner? And if you've got loads of boxes unticked that you've not tried, it's likely that if you tick some of them, you'll get better. All right, so that is episode one of Down But Not Out. Thanks for watching. Uh, future ideas we've got coming up for this series is looking into my diet, my psychology, how I'm training, the ups, the downs, we're going to cover it all until I'm back on the world stage competing for GB or I'm a washed up athlete that'll never run again. See you next time.